long ago, I, I, I mentioned this before, I used to consult with camps. Um, I would travel around and go to, to various camps to look at their, their summer programs and suggest positive changes. Usually, I made those trips in the late winter or early spring so they could be ready for summer. Now, late winter, early spring is actually a very busy time for most camps. They're, they're working very hard getting all the building and grounds ready for, uh, for the summer. So I found it really useful to take the first day that I was there and just volunteer and do grunt work with them. Whatever stuff they needed done, I would, I would just do. And it, it, it built some relationships so the other days as I would meet with the staff, we had kind of bonded over hard work. So one time, <clears throat> one trip I want to tell you about, I was in Latin America and the very first morning I said, hey, I want to help. And so I w- they woke me up very early. And first thing in the morning, I was handed a bottle of this oily stuff and a big sponge. And I was told, Drano, Drano was my camp name, Drano, frote a las caballos para eliminar las moscas. So Drano, rub down the horses to stop the flies. So I did, man. I sprayed all the horses and rubbed them down. And when I finished that, I was called over by the groundskeeper guy, and he said, hey, Drano, would you please lubricate uh, this hedge trimmer? Use the light oil here. So I got the, I took the hedge trimmer apart. I got the light oil. I oiled up all the parts and got it back together. And after lunch, um, I was told, hey, Drano, will you take this sprayer? By the way, sprayer. Sprayer in Spanish is so much cooler than in English. Look, look at it. Pulverizador. Pulverizador. Pulverizer. Sprayer. Pulverizer. It's so much cooler. Anyway, take this pulverizer and spray the, the fruit trees with the horticultural oil. Okay. I go back uh, really tired. I go back that night, have dinner, and I go to my bedroom, and I'm reading my Bible before bed. And the text contained this phrase, anointed with oil. And it hit me differently than it ever had because I spent the entire day using different kinds of oils, anointing with oil. It's a very important concept in Scripture, including in Psalm 23, where we are today. Open your Bible to the 23rd Psalm, if you would, 23rd Psalm. Let's listen to God's Word. We'll read the 23rd Psalm. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. There you see it. Anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Let's get a handle on that, starting with the first line. You'll see it referenced in your notes. You got a card when you came in that has notes on it. If you're online with us, we are delighted to be with you. Uh, You should have a link there, and you'll see the first place for notes is you anoint my head. Remember my very first task that winter day? at the camp. It was to spray the horses. Now, these kinds of insecticides are powered by a synergist. Um, a, a synergist is an oil product that, um, that, that works a little bit like a catalyst. It, it, it activates the medicines that are in the compound and the oil makes it stick to the animal skin better. Um, in, in this case, uh, the, what I was using had PBO in it. It's the most popular. That's an oil made from the sassafras plant. Uh, which is what root beer is made from. And you would think it would smell good like root beer. It doesn't. It stinks. But, um, but so that's the synergist that is in there. Ancient shepherds pioneered this practice. Nothing has really changed in thousands of years. They would rub an oil-based medicine around the mucous membranes of their animals' heads to keep insects from tormenting them. And they used a synergist as well. They used the olive oil uh, from, from the olive tree. It's a, a plant. Actually, if you look at the chemical structure, you'll see it's very similar to the PBO that was in what I used. Um, they would take plant medicines and they would pulverize them. Pulverizador. And they would, they would pulverize those and stir them up into the oil, sometimes heating the oil to get them stirred in well. And then that was used to stick to the animal skin and deliver the medicine. So when you see in Scripture, anoint my head with oil, that is a shorthand for this whole process, right? It's, it's a wholesome, 
healthy thing. It sounds so easy and sweet, doesn't it? Anoint my head with oil. But it's not easy. Animals, as I learned that day in Latin America, often don't like the oil. It smells funny. It tastes bad. That's why many ranchers have to force their sheep all the way down into a full body dip. And even then, the sheep don't like it. Let let me show you a little video here from England. as you'll see in a moment, but they do have to just be encouraged into the bath with a little hook around the leg, and in they go. And it's very important that each sheet gets dipped underwater completely at least three times uh, to make sure there's no lice or any insects on them anywhere at all. So they've dumped and ducked three times into the water. There's a ramp outside the thing, and they walk back out the ramp, out of the dip, into the draining area. Just a little bit of encouragement. <laughs> Grabs, <laughs> bash them down. By the way, this is my walking stick. Has the twenty third Psalm written around it, and uh, and and they, I mean they force these animals in it. They don't like it. So why do why do we do it? Why force the animal to do something that it doesn't really like at all? I mean, how bad could it be if you just left them alone? Dr. Braden Campbell of Ohio State University kindly answered that question for us. Look at what he said. The female of the sheep nosebot fly, which is Ostris ovus, deposits living larvae, that's maggots, in the nostrils of sheep during the spring and summer. These larvae migrate to the head sinuses where they feed on internal secretions. Okay, if you want an image of how that must feel, you can watch an old movie called The Wrath of Khan. It'll give you an idea. Um, (laughs) After the development in there, through the winter, they migrate back down the nasal passages, dropping to the ground where they pupate and become adults. Migration of the larvae irritates the nasal membranes, you think, Um, often causing sneezing, labored breathing, and blood fleck in the nasal discharge. Infested sheep shake their heads, stamp their feet, hold their noses to the ground, and even bang their heads against feed bunks, bunks, fences, or the ground. The presence of maggots in the head may cause blind staggers, which is a deadly disease, and severely infested older or weak sheep may actually die as a result of the bots. It's necessary. Therefore, it is abominably stupid for any lamb to resist the oil, right? But as we have noted throughout this series, what do we know, everybody? Sheep, they is dumb. And yet, Look at your text. David uses that exact image for himself and every single follower of Yahweh. The Lord is my shepherd. We are his sheep. Uh, the guys at the satirical Babylon Bee, they, um, they had a great piece on this last week. Um, fake story here. Shores of Galilee. After the disciples asked the teacher why he always portrayed them as sheep in parables, Jesus helpfully explained that it's because sheep are very, very stupid. After an hour, I started to get the picture that perhaps the Lord sometimes finds us a bit slow, said the Apostle (laughs) Philip. There were a lot of things like, verily I tell you, sheep are so dumb, close quote. In a moment, we'll see how fully this applies to our lives as modern Christians. First, just please note this. The application of oil is not necessarily pleasant for the sheep in the short term. Yet it is critically, critically important for their health. The the second image used here in this text is covered on the other side of our notes. Look there, my cup overflows. Word for cup is really interesting here. Kos, um, it it appears to be, best as I can tell, a fairly new word at the time David uses it. David doesn't make it up, but it seems to be a a slang term that was kind of catching on. It's It's a shortened version of an older word, a very important word that meant drinking receptacle. Now, these drinking receptacles were really, really significant in the, in the politics of the Bronze Age and, and into the Iron Age. The, um, the, the cup, if you could call it that massive bowl thing, uh, usually was gilded very fancy, and it was set in front of the important guest, and then it was filled up... No. No one was ever expected to drink that much unwatered wine. That wasn't the point. In fact, the whole point was that it'd be more than anyone could drink because you were showing how abundant your table was, how well you provided for this guest, right? All right, David takes that, he puts a slang on it, and he says, look, that is what a shepherd does for his sheep. 
The provision of the good shepherd is abundantly more than any sheep could ever need. So an Israeli shepherd, and, and this is what was done, would take a... a, a a bowl like this. They called it a bowl. It's actually huge. It's a two-handled clay jar. By the way, this one was found in the area that seems to be David's palace uh, under the old city of David, uh, south of, if you've been in Jerusalem, south of there, there's a big dig going on you can't get into yet, and it appears to be where David and Solomon had their palace. This one was found there. And uh, the shepherd would take this, this great big clay bowl, he would dip it in the water source, the well, or run, usually living water, running water, and then would hold it out. There's no way any, no matter how thirsty you know, sheep could drink all that. And that is to show the incredible abundance of what God gives. This is how God provides. When I swim my daily laps, Kenobi, the greatest dog in the world, likes to come out and join me. And, and he likes to run along the side of the pool while I swim. He's a show-off. He likes to show off. He is so much faster than I. And, um, and, and I swim, and I'm swimming fast. I swim hard, and, and he's always faster. And when I get to the end of the lap, he is standing there waiting on me, laughing at me, calling me a slowpoke. Anyway, um, and then I do my turn, and I, and I go back, and he runs back the other way. And, and sometimes when he's run back and forth a lot, uh, he'll get really thirsty. He'll kind of stand there panting and leaning down toward the pool. So I will, I will scoop water in my hands, and I will make my makeshift bowl and hold it up to him, and he laps it all dry. And, and it's often a, a, a few times before he is satiated. Occasionally, especially when it's really hot, um, he will kind of whimper in the time between he's dried one out and I'm going to get the next. It's just a second. And he's <laughs> like he wants more. And I tell him, hey, relax, bud. I have a whole swimming pool here. You're okay, <laughs> right? The cost flows over. God looks at you, puppies and says, hey, I have all that you need and more. This is abundant provision. The good shepherd, God himself, provides what is needed for his people, and it is even cooler than some kind of fancy drinking goblet. There's, there's a beautiful expression of this in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 9, verse 12. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. It is sufficient. All God's people said... Amen. What God gives is more than enough. All right, back in Psalm 23, the Hebrew continues to sparkle. Look at the word for overflows, reveya. Uh, reveya appears only here in all of the Old Testament, only appears here. Now, as far as I can tell, there were, there were seven possible words that God could have inspired David to use here to talk about uh, under abundance, overflowing, and, and yet God chose this one word that means to be so saturated that you can't help but just pass on. You're, you're so full, you're, everything is so full and absorbed that it just flows over. He only uses this term right here in all of the Old Testament. Why? I don't know. Uh, at least I don't know for certain. I do have a theory. Can, can, I, can I bore you with my theory? All right, here's, here's my possible theory. Why Reveya here? I think it was a cultural issue. You see, in the old Babylonian cultures that were dominant to the east of where David lived in Israel, in the old Babylonian cultures, uh, there was a practice, it was done every day, where people would pour uh, wine or sometimes water uh, through a clay pipe into a hole in the ground. Sounds weird. Here's why. The belief was in those old Sumerian peoples that the dead were trapped underground, but it wasn't a place of uh, caliche limestone like you live in. It was considered a place of a very arid desert, and they had nothing to drink. So they were just, they were dry all the time. So you would make these fancy, here's one, you can see it right here. This is uh, one of the little plates that would be on the ground, uh, pottery made plates. This one's in the Louvre. Don't go right now. It's full of Olympic people. But, um, uh, but you would put a clay pipe in there and you would pour for the ancestors. By the way, the, the god or goddess, in this case, this is a vegetation goddess here, would take their cut and, um, and then the rest would go. So the ancestors could have something to drink. You would pour out every day. That was the east of where David lived. To the west of where David was in Egypt, in the areas influenced by Egypt, they had a similar practice, although it was, it was not for ancestors at all. It was for the gods. It was called a libation, and your offering was expected to be 10%. So if you were given a, a cup to drink, you would, you would splash out 
10% of it or more, and, uh, and that was your gift to the gods. By the way, the Egyptian gods, they were way too good to work for their own provision. Humans were their slaves, and you were expected to, to give them drink this way, and so you had to take care of the gods. Okay, so that's the east, that's the west. In the middle of those practices, God says, Revaya. He provides overflowing drink for his people. Notice, Yahweh is the provider. He's not the recipient. What, what, humans have nothing to give God. He provides so abundantly that, the, that his person is saturated. No dusty cure for his people. Humans never sacrifice anything for God. He gives so richly that they... Whenever they do give anything to God, it's just the overflow of the abundance of his gift that flows down to others. Isn't that fascinating? Totally different than what was going on in the world around them. Now, our analysis of those clauses leads to some inclusions that were intended by the psalm. You'll see uh, them listed in our notes. First, the shepherd seals me. Just as an Israeli shepherd sealed with medicinal oil, so God seals his child. The maggots cannot get in and harm the sheep. Likewise, death cannot pierce the soul of the Christian. I was honored uh, a few years ago to be the visiting scholar at a place called Gladstone's Library in Wales. It's actually a kind of a fancy camp for Anglican intellectuals. Um, the, the amazing staff there, it was amazing and very kind that they let me, a non-Anglican, be their visiting scholar. And that meant that I got a desk in one of the most beautiful libraries in the world, and, uh, and I had this incredibly talented librarian staff that helped me with my research every day. Uh, they had manuscripts there that were from the 13th century and on, and it was just wonderful. At night, the only thing that I had to do for this incredible opportunity was at night I had to meet in the drawing room with all of these bishops and, and canons and deacons and priests from the Anglican church and, uh, and just visit. And it was lovely, except when they offered me port wine. Um, anyway, um, but they had no Mountain Dew at all. It was insane. Um, so the, uh, for those of you in other countries, that's a drink from America that's really not good for you. But, um, uh, but the diet's okay. Uh, and both of the vice presidential candidates in America right now are big fans of Diet Mountain Dew. So, so I will share a drink with whoever is VP soon. Um, anyway, the, um, so these guys would come and they would offer port wine and, uh, and I'd have a cup of tea and we would talk. And if they had a manuscript, they'd present it. I was expected to read and comment. One of the guys I met, brilliant, they were all brilliant, a guy named Ashley Knoll, Dr. Knoll, who taught in Germany, where his name means Dr. Zero, which I thought was hilarious. Um, <laughs> Dr. Knoll brought a manuscript that was actually really, really good. And it was for athletes, which was kind of interesting because he isn't super athletic. But it was a book for athletes. It got published uh, not long after that, and I recommend it highly. It's called Real Joy. Here's the thesis of Ashley's book. You cannot allow your high-performance athletics to warp your understanding of grace. If you're a Christian, you are sealed in the Spirit. Do your best. Do your best by his empowerment, but remember, nothing you do can make God love you any less or any more. The book of Ephesians addresses this. Here, read, read with me the underlying parts. Ephesians 1, 13, in him, Paul's talking about God the Father, you, and he's specifically addressing Gentile Christians. He's already addressed Jews. Um, in him, you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. Ephesians 4.30, the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Amen, amen. Christians are sealed permanently in the Holy Spirit. If you trust Jesus as Savior, your soul is preserved for the day when Jesus returns. My old professor, uh, Harold Honer, put it this way. Uh, he said the word seal, and here he quotes a bunch of scripture, indicates security, authentication, and approval, certification of genuineness, and identification of ownership. God is the one who seals. Christ is the sphere in which the seal is done. The Holy Spirit is the instrument of the seal. The Holy Spirit who seals is a down payment with a guarantee of more to come. It guarantees believers inheritance of salvation and heaven. In essence, the deposit of the Holy Spirit is a little bit of heaven in believers' lives 
with a guarantee of much more yet to come. All God's people said? At a camp in Europe one time, I was uh, spending time with the staff. Again, I was spending that day working before the consultation. And, uh, and I volunteered for a job they needed done. They had just built beautiful decking off of the dining hall, and it needed to be sealed. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll seal the decking. And they provided all the stuff. And the sealant they provided was amazing. Now, it was very dangerous stuff. I mean, I had to wear a hazmat suit. And by the way, the label in German, I'm not exaggerating at all. It said, do not touch, do not breathe, don't know anyone who has touched or breathed this. <laughs> but it was incredible. When you put that sealant on, this was a lifetime guarantee. For the life of the piece of wood, it was absolutely guaranteed. Uh, they don't, by the way, they don't sell those chemicals in the States um, for two very good reasons. They think Americans are too dumb to use something like that, and their tort lawyers are too smart. So, um, so they don't want anything to do with the American market. But this stuff laid the just thinnest veneer on there, and it was incredible. It just looked so great. That sealant is similar to what the saturating, overflowing love of God does for those who trust Him. Those who accept His, his dipping are sealed for life. I know, of course it doesn't feel that way. I mean, when we're overwhelmed with the shame uh, raining down on our souls, when the, when the hail of rejection or failure uh, beats down on us, when the dry winds of, of doubt scour our hearts, we, we've got to remember the truth that we are sealed by God our shepherd. Oh, we, we probably don't look any differently outwardly, just like that sealant was a very thin layer that didn't change anything about the color of the deck. It was so thin it was invisible, but the seal is there. So next time, when you're feeling doubt, when you're thinking that you have been abandoned by God, that your sin has finally just driven you outside of God's seal, remember, Christian, you anoint my head with oil. I am sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Here, write this in your heart. Let's repeat them together. Uh, Psalm 23, verse 5, all together. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Ephesians 4, verse 30. The Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Amen. A few years ago, a, a very promising young athlete, British athlete, um, was burning out. The, the pressure was just getting to this poor kid. He was abusing alcohol. He was destroying relationships. It, it was just sad. It was an awful wreck. So, um, so another athlete who was a friend of his had read, um, had read Ashley's book, read my, my Anglican friend Dr. Knoll's book, and he said, you need to meet this guy. So he made an appointment with Dr. Knoll, and he got this young athlete to come along and go meet with Ashley. And in that meeting... Ashley presented to him the gospel of Jesus Christ, and, and the guy responded and trusted Jesus, and his life's never been the same. By the way, you know this athlete. You know him as Adam Peaty, actually Sir Adam Peaty, and, uh, and there's Ashley Knoll. Before the Olympics uh, began in 2024, Peaty shared this in an interview. He said, in Christ, I am complete. Competing is wonderful, but for me, the only fulfillment, the only peace is every Sunday at church, close quote, is from an article called My Faith Has Made Me a New Man. Uh, I, know, I, I know what you're wondering. In your Rowdy Gaines imitation, um, Rowdy Gaines does not have an inside voice. I don't know if you know this. Um, you're saying to yourself, sure, he felt good before. How much good did being sealed do him when he lost the gold by 0 0.02 seconds? Rowdy Gaines, right? Great question, Rowdy. Listen to Petey's own answer. This is the night he lost. He said this, I'm not crying because I came second or lost. In my heart, I've won. These are happy tears. Close quote. The shepherd seals me so I know my inheritance. I have already won. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. The shepherd seals me and he offers me knowledge. Now this part is very often missed, so please listen carefully. In Scripture, Ceremonial anointing of a human, when it says he anoints me, it's never merely about the physical act. It always involves knowledge. Thus, anointing 
It empowers and establishes the person through knowledge. I just want to show you, let's consider anointing just in the Psalms, okay? Uh, Psalm 45, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of what, everybody? Joy. So the person in this case is supposed to learn what? Joy. The anointing is all about teaching you that you, that you have and, and you should share joy. Here's, here's another one, Psalm 89. Psalm 89 was written by um, a guy named Ethan. We're told that he was one of the wisest people to ever live. He said, uh, God's perspective speaking, I have found David my servant. I have anointed him with my sacred oil. My hand will always be with him and my arm will strengthen him. David wasn't merely anointed by Samuel. He was anointed as the servant king. In Psalm 89, this very wise Ethan looks back to that anointing in David's life and he shows what David learned. You know what David learned in that anointing? Not just that he would be king, but that God's hand would always be with him. Let me show you one more. Look at what's being learned in Psalm 141. Psalm 141, um, do not let my heart turn to any evil thing or perform wicked acts with evildoers. Do not let me feast on their delicacies. Let the righteous one strike me. It is an act of faithful love. By the way, the greatest sermon illustration ever happened last night. Um, in our pool, a pastor and his family were, were with us for the weekend, getting a little vacation. And, um, and here, let me just tell you the story like this. There is right now on my back porch a little orange plastic shark. And he is telling all the other little toys there about the two-year-old with the amazing arm and the old guy who was swimming with a four-year-old that never saw him coming. It, um, that shark got me. I don't know if you can see it right here. And, uh, and I thought it was awesome. It bled like a stuck pig. It was so cool. Anyway, the, um, and I thought, this is perfect. I mean, not really because he wasn't rebuking me, but he could have been, right? So look at what you're learning here. Let the righteous one strike me. It is an act of faithful love. Let him rebuke me. It is oil for my head. Let me not refuse it. Correction is the anointing here. It is a blessing to be reminded of right and wrong. You see how this works. Every anointing teaches something. So go back to Psalm 23. Many of the same lessons um, that we just looked at are here in this psalm in one tidy package. Look what God gives. God gives joyful abundance and protection. He is with us even in the midst of darkness, even in the darkest valley. I fear no danger. His correction, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They're comforting. You, remember, sheep very often fight against the anointing. It feels strange. It smells bad. It hurts. But you, O oh sentient human made in the image of God, you can and should know better. You and I should open ourselves to the knowledge given by our shepherd. Yes, we are sealed once forever in the Holy Spirit of God, but he continues to anoint us and teach us, and we must learn and listen. I recommend, if you ever meet him, that you ask a guy named Caleb Dressel about this. Uh, some quick facts about Caleb Dressel. He's a believer in Jesus. He is the only person other than Michael Phelps to ever win seven gold medals in one international swim meet. Um, his nine golds tie him for the second most in all of Olympic history, and he married his childhood swimming friend, Megan. Sounds great, right? But it almost wasn't. You see, when Dressel was a senior in high school, he walked away from both the Lord and, and from the pool. He struggled with he called, uh, what he called mental demons, and he chose very unwise self-medication. Thankfully, the Lord's love pursued him, as it does for all of God's sheep. Dressel turned back to Jesus in active trust. He eventually got back in the water. He describes it this way. I started swimming again and really just put all my trust in God and knowing, look for the learning here, that he's going to take care of everything for me, good or bad. I really learned a lot, and I learned to trust what God is doing, whether it be a rough point in your life or a top pinnacle of your life. We learn. We accept the shepherd's lessons as part of his anointing. Or the other option, we refuse to learn and we end up sick and apart from where we can truly flourish. And if we choose not to learn, it doesn't just hurt us for today. It actually has a deleterious effect for the next opportunity we have to learn. Um, uh, you, have you heard of the, the Dunning-Kruger effect? Um, it's, it's a 
a, a very well shown uh, fact, I think, in the psychiatry that uh, someone who is actually not bright or good at something thinks they're really great at it. Um, this is from the original paper written by, by Dunning and Kruger that led to an entire field of psychiatry. The effect, now called the Dunning-Kruger effect, describes a cognitive bias whereby people with limited knowledge or competence in a given domain greatly overestimate their own knowledge or competence in that domain relative to objective criteria. In other words, sheep is dumb, but they think they are smart, right? <laughs> there was an Irish band, uh, The Undertones. They wrote a great punk uh, song, a spoof song about this. Look what they wrote. I'm a little intellectual, someone who knows it all. I'm a human calculator. Five and five and five is ten. Smarter than you, smarter than you, smarter than you. Can't you see I'm smarter than you? That's genius. I was chilled the other day by a very sad conversation I had with a Christian I know. Uh, about, uh, it just was a horrible illustration of what we're talking about here, the anointing and knowledge. This guy is a, uh, a Hollywood actor. He's known as a Christian, which is cool and rare in Hollywood. But lately, he's been publicly complaining a lot, vitriolically complaining about this one politician. He, he thinks this politician is really dumb and especially doesn't listen. They just won't listen. And I was watching him rant about this, and so I wrote him a private note. Always do this in private. I wrote him a private note, and I said, hey, brother, Keep in mind our tendency, as Paul put it in Romans 7, to become the very thing we hate. You think that person's not listening? I, be careful. And he said in reply, and I quote, that's a risk I'm willing to take. I have nothing more to learn about this subject. A scriptural blessing of knowledge was applied right to his head and the dummy rejected it. He rejected it. Thank goodness we never do that. What do you need to learn? What, what do I need to learn? Some, sometimes anointing stinks. We don't like it. But we must grow and accept God's knowledge. Let's pray about that. Pray with me. Father, I pray for myself. I pray for my brothers and sisters. First of all, I want to ask your forgiveness for the ways in which we have not accepted your anointing, not, not our permanent anointing in the Holy Spirit. We praise you for that, that we are sealed, but for the way you care so much that you continue to anoint and overflow with goodness in our lives, and we don't want to hear it. And we, we know, Lord, a lot of us know how it works. Everybody else can see the flaw sometimes but we're just blind to it. We think we're the face of the franchise of our family. We're actually acting a whole lot more like the ugly pimple on the end of the nose. And we're sorry. Go to the Lord right now. In his word and through his spirit, he teaches, he gives knowledge anoints your head with oil for your protection and your good and his glory. What is it? You know, it, it, what has been popping up in Scripture and in conversation and in your heart as you pray and think? Are you, are you rejecting joy? Are you being too glum? Is it selfishness? It's a very popular one in our day. You know, you see everybody else is entitled, but of course you're not. Is it avarice? Are you, are, you, uh, are you greedy? Are you jealous? What do you need to learn? How much you're loved? Is it, is it insecurity that you need to learn to conquer? If you don't know how to look for that one, look for areas of pride or, or sexual immorality. Those tend to be tied to insecurity. Father, show me. Guide us in what you would have us learn. And we pray that we will accept your anointing and grow up. We know you desire for us to be growing from glory unto glory into the image of Jesus and we know that means we've got to grow 
and we pray for the process and an openness to being dipped. In Jesus' name, amen.